So thank you for the invitation to share my research at the fourth forum on ecological and economic impacts of invasive species. My name is Professor Matthew Harrington from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the muscle byssus and uh, kind of how it relates to their ability to uh, muscles in general, their ability to attach onto surfaces and contribute as a major biofowler um, across many species. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the group. Uh, who has done all the work that, that you're about to see. Um, they're a fantastic group of young researchers uh, who are just interested in unlocking the, the mysteries of nature. Um, and uh, they, they've contributed to this work that you'll hear about today. So our group is really more generally interested in how um, various organisms produce fibers from proteins or from uh, sugar chains such as cellulose. Um, and it's because these, these materials themselves have amazing properties. Uh, muscle byssus we study, also velvet worm, slime fibers, and um, mistletoe berry attachment mechanisms. Um, all of these uh, examples are, are very robust, tough fibers, um, but also adhesives. They're also able to stick onto surfaces. And we investigate why they have such great properties what we're really interested in uh, recently is how they're formed. How does the organism actually uh, build these materials outside their body from uh, kind of liquid uh, biomolecular precursors? And in particular, we've spent a lot of time studying the muscle byssus. Uh, I've been working on uh, this, this organism for over, um, I think, almost 15 years now. And we're really interested in these, uh, this muscle byssus and also these other systems. We, th we think that also they can teach humans something um, about how to make materials in a more uh, environmentally friendly way. So if we focus specifically here on the muscles, um, muscles are uh, come in all different shapes and sizes. They live in all different sorts of environments from, from uh, high impact wave regions in the intertidal zone, fresh water in rivers and lakes, uh, and also kind of in uh, deeper waters in the Mediterranean as we have here with the Pinanobolus. But many species uh, utilize a byssus in order to attach or anchor themselves in these different environments. So the byssus you can really see here with the middleus muscle, it's a collection of fibers that uh, at least in middleus are uh, allowing the muscle to stick onto hard surfaces and anchor itself. The fibers themselves are very tough, very stiff, uh, and they have excellent properties. Um, Dreisena, so this is the zebra muscle. Um, you can't really see the fibers very well here uh, in this image, but they also have um, smaller fibers similar to these that they, they attach to each other or they attach onto rocks. Uh, and uh, Pinanobolus actually has a different strategy. It also has many fibers. You can see its byssus here, but in, in that case, this muscle is quite large, as you can see from the, the picture here, and it buries itself under the sediment, and it uses its byssus kind of as an anchor inside that sediment. Now, the interesting thing here is that, uh, as, as, I'll, as I'll show you, these three different types of abyssal threads, even though they have very similar material properties, are actually, um, independently involved. So this is an example of convergent evolution. And I think you'll see that later in the talk. They all have different um, molecular origins in terms of these ones are collagen based. These ones are based on uh, beta sheet proteins. And these ones are, are actually made from globular proteins that form into, into a helix. So very different origins, uh, very similar mechanics, um, and all evolved as strategies for, for maintaining attachment. Now, mussels in general are major bio, biofowlers, and in particular, Dreisena, or the zebra mussel, also uh, quagga mussels, are a major invasive species in, in many habitats. So understanding how these mussels attach onto these surfaces uh, is important for understanding maybe how to prevent the biofowling or their, their ability to be invasive. Now, beyond uh, the byssus, you're probably familiar with middleus. 
uh, as as a food. It's very common. Uh, the blue mussel that that you you eat this um, you know with uh, maybe some pasta or, or some fries. Um, but we're we're going to look beyond that. We're going to get really in, in depth into understanding the structure of these uh, bissel threads and how they're made. The zebra mussel, as I mentioned, is a major uh, invasive species in North America, originally from Europe. Uh, it was introduced into North America rivers and lakes and has spread uh, quite a lot. And it's a major problem for biofouling. It's, it's on the bottom of boats. It's um, filling up pipes. And it's a major uh, multi-billion dollar problem. Uh, the Pinanobilis uh, is actually um, a protected species that lives in the Mediterranean Ocean. And um, this is a picture of Chiara Vigo, who we, we collaborated with on a, on a project studying these bissel threads. Um, and she's one of the last um, of a long line of uh, artisans who create fabrics from um, from these Pinanobilis threads. This is a activity that has its origins back in uh, ancient Roman times uh, where these, uh, these golden fabrics were, were prized by the very wealthy. So I hope at least with this slide, I've convinced you that muscle bissel threads are interesting. And in the rest of the talk, we're gonna chat a bit about um, how they're made and, and how they function. So the research strategy in our group is to start uh, at the biomaterial level and to distill the concepts uh, of this material down to the nanoscale so that hopefully we can build this back up into synthetic materials. We're a bio-inspired materials lab. So we're interested to make new polymers that are based on these um, biological role models. This involves uh, a multi-scale approach starting uh, from the composition. So what are the, what are the building blocks this is made of? How are they organized structurally across multiple length scales? And how does this all relate to the function of, of the fibers themselves? Uh, and through this, we're creating so-called structure function relationships. Uh, and we're also trying to understand these biofabrication processes. If we're successful, we can take these design principles and either in our own group or with collaborators, we can make new materials that have interesting properties. So today I'm gonna to really focus on the question of how do muscles create a robust attachment onto surfaces um, and, and how to, more specifically, how do they build these materials? So we're gonna start first with the middleest muscles. And again, these, these live in a high impact, uh, rocky intertidal region where waves are, are crashing. And this is a high nutrient zone, but the only way you're able to survive in this, in this area is through a secure attachment. Now, muscles uh, are able to achieve this through their byssus. And their byssus, uh, as you can see, it's a number of these small protein-based fibers. They're about a couple centimeters long and maybe a few hundred microns in diameter. They're entirely made of proteins. There are no living cells inside these. Uh, inside these. And the muscles actually secrete, um, secrete these proteins and they self-assemble into these fibers. The fibers themselves, in spite of being uh, just kind of a secretion, have a very complex structure. So if we take a zoom in at this area here, you can see these different parts. There's the plaque, which is actually the underwater adhesive. Um, the adhesive action actually takes place only at this layer here and up above you have more kind of an energy damping foam. Uh, into the foam, you can see that the fiber is kind of anchored and the fiber itself is made up of what's called the core and the cuticle. The core is kind of the tensile element that does all the damping of the crashing waves. Uh, and the cuticle is an abrasion resistant coating that sits on the surface and protects, um, and protects the thread. Okay. And so today I'm gonna to be telling you uh, a bit about some of the work that we do on the core and the cuticle. So I'm gonna start with the cuticle and the cuticle, as I said, is a very thin layer that sits on the outside of the core. The core is based on collagen, as we'll see later. That's why it stains blue with this trichrome stain. And we can see the cuticle here is staining uh, red in this histological stain. If we look at this with scanning electron microscopy and, and transmission electron microscopy, we can see that the coating kind of has a, a bumpy texture. And actually, if we look specifically at the TEM here, we can see that it's made up of these regions we call granules, which are 
kind of round inclusions, and then the matrix, which is a, a kind of an amorphous uh, region between the granules. And you can see the granule itself has this kind of brainy structure, which we'll talk about, I'll talk about in more detail in, in a few minutes. Um, these these uh, the, the cuticle is actually made up again um, of, of proteins, several proteins. Uh, and one of the proteins is enriched in an amino acid called 3,4-dihydroxyphenylalanine. It's a modification of the amino acid tyrosine that turns it into a catechol. And so one of our early discoveries of, of, um, of this cuticle, we, we were interested, well, what makes, it, what makes it so hard and then still stretchy at the same time, right? We wanted to understand this process. And we were doing some, um, a technique called Raman spectroscopy, where you're basically hitting your sample with, with a laser and you're measuring the molecular vibrations inside your sample. It gives you a fingerprint of what types of molecules and what types of crosslinks are inside your sample. And using this technique, we identified that we had a very, very interesting and, and strange type of crosslink called a, called a metal coordination bond. And in this case, basically these catechol side groups of the DOPA amino acids in these proteins were coordinating with a metal ion. So here's an iron uh, ion that you see here. Um, and there's three of these amino acids that kind of grab onto it. And it makes a really strong but reversibly breakable bond, right? And this was really an interesting discovery because this hadn't really been discovered in, in any other system, uh, material system before. Uh, and we showed that these bonds are reversible. So if we used a metal chelator called EDTA that will grab onto these metal ions and pull it out, uh, we, we lose these special signals coming from the metal coordination bonds and we just see the protein signal. However, we can then take these EDTA treated threads and soak them in different types of metal ions that are known to interact with, with, um, with DOPA. And we get these signals back telling us this is a fully reversible bond. And, but this, we, we wanted to understand what's the, what's the function of this. So we used a technique called nano indentation, which is a way of measuring stiffness and hardness of very small materials. So basically we're sticking a small tip into our coating and we're measuring how stiff it is. Uh, and what you can see here is really interesting. So in the native, which is the green, we're looking at stiffness and hardness. When we remove the metals, we lose about 80 to 85% of our stiffness and hardness, but then that this is almost fully recoverable when we add in these different metal ions. This tells us that this is a metal reinforced uh, coating, protein coating. Um, this was a completely new kind of paradigm in the way of building materials and has inspired uh, many um, you know, bio-inspired metallopolymers that are, that are inspired by the muscle. Um, and interestingly, what we found here is that the metal coordination is actually concentrated inside the granules and not so much in the matrix. So we think that this is what gives it this very hard. So when you press on these things, they, they behave hard. But the fact that you have less of these uh, crosslinks in the matrix that allows it to be stretchy at the same time. So it's kind of a really cool, um, a really cool design principle for, for making a hard and stretchy material, uh, which is not found in, in man-made materials. Um, and it's achieved using this really interesting crosslink chemistry. So we wanted to look a little bit more into detail about what's the difference between the matrix and the granules, and more specifically, what's, what's this kind of brainy texture that we see here inside the granules. So we decided to use a technique called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. So SEM is a surface technique. You can only look at the surface, but if you use a focused ion beam that is uh, oriented at an angle to your, your uh, electron microscope beam, you can cut away one layer at a time, take a picture, cut away a letter, another layer, take a picture, right? And through this, you get this image stack um, of different pictures. And from that, you can then recreate a three-dimensional reconstruction of your sample with very high resolution. So 10 to 20 nanometer resolution. Um, so what we did there was we took one of our threads. Again, this is our, our Bissell thread. Uh, this brighter yellow is the coating. And so we were taking uh, a cross section of our coating, cutting, cutting through our, our thread. Here's the core, here's the cuticle. And what you're gonna see in this movie here is actually the image stack. As we're going down through these images, you can see now 
we can see the details of our coding. We can see our granules and matrix. If we zoom in on a specific region here, we can specifically see one of our granules and we can really see this brainy structure. And again, this is a, not a movie, it's actually an image stack. And so what we can do, we can take that image stack and we can uh, recreate this into 3D images. And this was work done um, by a PhD student named uh, Franziska Jela when I was still back at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, and basically what she found is that uh, these brainy structures are actually uh, bicontinuous flattened layers. So they have a, a very uh, uniform thickness of about 20 nanometers. Uh, and when we looked at this, we thought this looks really similar to something called a block copolymer. Block copolymers are polymer chains. So like little pieces of spaghetti and one side of the chain uh, has different properties than the other side of the chain and they don't mix with each other. And so they phase separate. Um, so you might have a nonpolar and a polar side of the chain. They phase separate depending on how long the A and B blocks are and their concentration, uh, they can separate into different structures. And we thought this kind of looks like a, um, a gyroid block copolymer structure. Uh, could it be, let's look at the protein. Well, with this protein, MFP1, which is known to be inside the cuticle, so this is the, the DOPA rich protein that's there, you get these um, about 80 repeats of this decapeptide sequence that's enriched with DOPA. So that's the Y with the asterisk. And then K is lysine. Lysine has a positive charge. So that makes this very hydrophilic. It makes it very polar. Uh, but then when we looked, at, so what you're looking at here is actually a hydro, hydropathy plot. Uh, this part is very polar. But then if we look, there's this, this N-terminal region of our protein that's non-repetitive and also much less polar. So actually, this does have the structure of a, uh, of a block copolymer. This is a hypothesis at this point that's untested, but we think that this uh, chemical structure might drive this into this phase separation from what you see here and might lead to the separation of these uh, dopa-rich proteins. Now, the question was, well, what else is in there? If, it's, if, if the dopa-rich proteins are being kind of uh, separated into these granules, what else is there? Uh, we used a technique called scanning transmission electron microscopy energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. It's a mouthful. What does it do? It basically just gives us compositional analysis, uh, compositional um, elemental composition of our sample at the nanoscale. And so what can we see here? We see the nitrogen is uniform. Well, that's not surprising because it's all protein. What's surprising is that you have the sulfur signal that is in the matrix and less in the granule, okay? Now, the MFP1 protein here has no sulfur in it. There's no sulfur-rich amino acids, but recently, right before we found this, uh, made this discovery, the group of Herb Waite and Santa Barbara discovered that there are a family of sulfur-rich, cysteine-rich proteins uh, that were predicted to be in the cuticle. And so we think we have evidence here that they are in the cuticle, but they're kind of separated away from the catechol dopa rich uh, MFP1 protein. It was an exciting finding. Additionally, what we found, which was really unexpected and unusual, is that these muscles are uh, then adding metals into this coating. And there's two different types of metals, iron. And again, this is, these are ionic metals. They're not, uh, they're not nanoparticles or minerals or anything like that iron and vanadium. And it looks like vanadium is really concentrating in the, in the granule where the dopa is. And actually we could already see that with our Raman spectroscopic findings and that the iron is associating with sulfur, which was completely unexpected. Um, and recently, this is uh, not in this talk, but recently one of my students has discovered that the muscles themselves are concentrating vanadium from the seawater and storing it inside their body to be used to make these bissel threads. So this is a really unusual uh, observation because tunicates, uh, ascidians are the only other species that have been uh, really shown to, to, to concentrate um, vanadium in their bodies. Uh, and it's still not even known what they use it for. Okay, so that was a really, uh, really interesting and uh, cool observation. And we wanted to understand, okay, this is a really delicate and complex hierarchical structure with a lot of organization at the nanoscale. How is this formed? How does this whole 
Um, how does this whole process work? Um, and muscles uh, create threads one at a time as a um, secretion of, of proteins uh, into an organ called the foot. So if we just go briefly back to this video here, this is a video of a muscle forming a thread. This is the foot. The muscle reaches the foot out of the shell and starts secreting all the proteins into a little groove that runs along this foot. And you can see the thread popping out of here now. So each thread is formed in only about um, three to five minutes uh, as the secretion of, of protein. Uh, and to achieve this level of hierarchical structure in just minutes is, is pretty incredible. So we wanted to understand, well, what's the formation process like? And so this was uh, a project that was started uh, by uh, also a student, uh, Tobias Primel, uh, in collaboration with, with Franci. Um, and basically we looked at the foot here. So here's the foot where the, the thread is made. This is what the foot looks like with micro CT. Uh, so here you can see that groove. You can see this is the area where the actual, the adhesive is made, but this is the groove where the threads are secreted into. And if we take a cross section, uh, of this uh, of this foot organ near the groove, you can see you have secretory glands that are surrounding that. So we did some old fashioned um, histological staining and light microscopy, and we identified at least three different glands. And inside the glands are secretory vesicles in which all of these proteins are stored. Okay, so the muscle is actually mass manufacturing. Uh, the precursors, and then storing them in these little bubbles of uh, little vesicles that are then secreted during the formation process. And everything has to happen really quickly. Everything that's inside these vesicles is in a fluid phase, right? Because it needs to be secreted out and they need to coalesce and form this fiber, which is then incredibly stiff and incredibly hard uh, by, by polymer standards, right? So our question is, well, how do you go from here, fluid phase, to then the coating. And what was really interesting when we took a close look at the vesicles that are responsible for forming the cuticle, and I should mention you have these three glands, one forms the cuticle, one forms the core, and one forms the adhesive plaque. Uh, so we'll talk about this one now, and then we'll talk about these in a second. If we look at these vesicles here, we can already see that phase separation. Okay, so this uh, uh, this phase separation that we, we see in the native cuticle where you have the granule and the matrix, you already see here. So this is the proto-granule. This would be then the proto-matrix. Uh, and again, this is a fluid phase. So this is like a liquid-liquid phase separation. And you have this kind of biphasic um, structure, very unusual. Um, and we used, again, focused ion beam SEM to look at this in three dimensions. And you can see this is really a, a full-on phase separation between these two components, which using, again, scanning TEM EDX, we can get the compositional analysis. And we can see, again, it's all nitrogen. Nitrogen is uniform. It tells you it's all protein. Uh, but clearly we see this differentiation between the proto granule and the proto matrix. And again, we see the separation between the sulfur rich proteins and presumably the dopa rich protein. Interesting to notice here, no metals are stored together. The metals are important for cross-linking. So it'd be a very bad idea to store them together with the protein. These are added later. So that's also an interesting uh, twist to the story. So we wanted to follow the process of assembly. We can use a little trick that was discovered in the 70s. I never found uh, an explanation for why they did this, but it, it seems to work. But if you inject uh, a muscle foot with half a molar potassium chloride, you basically induce the secretion of all these proteins. Now the thread that comes out is not that pretty. Here's what we call the induced thread versus a native thread. It's very much doesn't, doesn't look the same, but it does have all the parts. It has all the parts, it has the core, it has the cuticle. So we look at this kind of as a example of assembly and the absence of biological intervention. It's just secreting the protein. So everything that happens is kind of a physical or chemical um, process that's happening. And what you can see here, this is inside the groove of an induced thread. We see our blue staining core. This is our collagen core we'll talk about in a second. What you see here is the, the beginnings of a coating the red coating here. And what we see here in the groove are the vesicles kind of coalescing and then spreading over the surface as a coating. 
okay? So they're, they're a liquid phase that's spreading. We can actually trap this induction process at various stages. And we can see, so these are some vesicles coming uh, that are about to be secreted out into the groove and, and assemble on the surface. And you can see uh, that these are, um, the vesicle contents are fusing together, but the granule or protogranule is actually staying separate. And what's fusing is this kind of proto matrix phase. Remember, if we look back here, this is, this is kind of the proto matrix, here's the proto granule. This is what's fusing together. If we look here, um, we can see that these are fusing together. And then at a later time point, they're out in the groove, spreading over the surface and making this coating. Okay, so this is, this is a really interesting way of making a very complex material um, that muscles use. And this, this material is very important from protecting these threads from, from uh, abrasion in the seawater environment. So our kind of take home message, um, our current model of, of what's happening here is that all these vesicles are, are stored inside the foot. They're pre-organized uh, into this phase separated liquid. These are secreted out into the groove. They start to fuse uh, because they're still liquid. And then by the time they're on the thread, um, they're spreading over the surface and they're making this coating with this very complex structure. Later on, the metal ions are added. Uh, again, we don't understand this process, but they are somehow self-segregating with vanadium going to the dopa rich uh, granule, which then forms these metal coordination bonds. And then iron is somehow associating with the sulfur, okay? And again, there's a lot of mysteries here, but it's, it's a pretty interesting way of building a coating. We think that the, the uh, phase separation between the sulfur rich and the um, dopa rich MFP1 is because of the block copolymer structure of MFP1. Again, untested hypothesis, but, but compelling. Uh, and we also um, proposed based on uh, work from the group of Herb Waite again at Santa Barbara that these cysteine rich proteins might actually play a role in maintaining the chemistry of the environment. So DOPA under seawater conditions is very prone to oxidize to the quinone form. When it gets to the quinone form, it's not able to bind to metals. So these, these cysteine rich uh, proteins might actually be reducing the oxidized DOPA back to the DOPA catechol form, which then can form these bonds. So this is kind of where this, this project sits now. Um, but there's new data coming every day. So what I'm gonna spend some time talking about now is not the coding, but the core. And the core, as I mentioned earlier, is a um, collagen, collagenous based fiber uh, that has high toughness and, and self-healing properties. So if we look at a stress strain, cyclic stress strain curve of um, a abyssal thread, you can see a really interesting behavior. Now. Um, I'm not sure of everybody's background with mechanical testing. These are basically, we're stretching this material and uh, to a certain, certain length and we're measuring the forces on the material. So stress is essentially normalized force, strain is normalized elongation. And when we cycle it the first time, it's very stiff, uh, but then at some point it yields. That means we're stretching, 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 and then it just kind of gives and stretches out. When we bring it back, normally this would mean that this material has undergone plastic deformation. It's done. Uh, it's not useful anymore. And actually, when we bring it back, uh, it fully recovers its length. So it, it tells us that there's some sort of elastic pullback on this material. In the second curve, we see that it's much less stiff, so it's damaged. It's undergone a lot of damage, so we cycle it again. It's still coming back with kind of an elastomeric recoil, but it's much less stiff. However, over time, if we let this um, rest, it will recover back to its own, towards its initial uh, mechanical properties. So this is really like a self-healing material. It's a material that can undergo pseudo uh, plastic deformation and then recover back to its initial properties. Uh, and so for that reason, a lot of people got interested in like, why is this material uh, able to do this? Because this is not a property of most uh, man-made plastics. When they undergo this yield point, that's it, they're done. So again, not going into the details of this, but this, these materials are interesting because they're stiff, they're extensible, they're very tough. Tough means how much energy can they, they dissipate before they break. Bissell threads are as tough as Kevlar. Kevlar is what they use to make bulletproof vests. So this is a very, very tough material we're talking about and it's self-healing. 
so we wanted to understand, um, you know, why does it have this property? So this this is a, an area of work uh, I've been at for for quite a long time, even during my PhD project. And it's known that these uh, that the core is made up of these special collagen proteins called precols. So the precols have this central domain, which is a pretty normal collagen sequence. It has a it has a repeat of glycine. Uh, XY, XY normally being proline or hydroxyproline, and it forms this very rigid rod uh, triple helix, okay? So that's, that's standard up to this point. But on the ends, they have these very special groups. Um, so on both ends, they have what we call the flanking domains. And at least in this part of the thread, the flanking domains are forming uh, beta sheet structure. And on both sides, that, that's the case. And at the very ends, you have these regions that are called the histidine-rich domains, which are enriched in an amino acid called histidine. Now, histidine also is able to bind metal ions like DOPA, but it binds different metal ions. It binds zinc or copper. Okay, so um, this was really interesting. And, and we actually made a discovery that, yes, in fact, there are histidine zinc complexes, metal coordination bonds inside these. And we think that this contributes to the self-healing properties and the high toughness. Okay. So this, this is the protein that makes up almost the entire core. We use then X-ray diffraction. Uh, it's a technique that allows us to get an idea of how these molecules are organized um, in space within in this thread. And the fact that you see these nice bright spots in very well uh, oriented areas on this um, image tells you that these, um, these proteins are highly organized. So first of all, we can figure out that uh, actually it's not just one triple helix that's the functional subunit, it's actually seven of them which are packed together in a kind of uh, hexagonal conformation. And then if we use what's called small angle X-ray scattering, so we look a little closer here, we're looking at larger um, structures in the material. And we can tell here that actually these, um, these bundles, so these six plus one hexagonal bundles are then organized in a very specific way with a slight stagger um, of 13 nanometers. So take home from that, details are less important. Take home from that is that these fibers are highly organized. They have a semi-crystalline semi structure. And our work tells us that actually this is really, really important to uh, the final mechanical properties of, of these fibers. Okay, so um, we wanted to understand how does this get made? And again, it's the same question we had before with the cuticle, how does it get made? Uh, so we looked again at the foot. Now in this case, we wanna understand how do you get something that's so highly organized uh, through secretion in just a couple of minutes under seawater conditions, right? Because it's environmentally friendly processing um, because no polymers are, are made like this uh, under, under these sort of benign conditions. So, so we wanted to understand this. Now, if you look at the core vesicles, they have this kind of football shape, American football. Uh, they stain red because they have collagen. So we can see the, the core gland here we can see all these little vesicles. So these are containing the proteins that then become uh, the core. And if we use not light microscopy, but polarized light microscopy, they glow bright. Whereas the ones uh, forming the, the plaque do not. What does that tell you? It tells you that the molecules inside these vesicles are actually aligned. So that we call this birefringence, right? So they're aligned. And actually when we used uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, we can see this very clearly. So these uh, layers here are actually made up of lined up pre coal bundles uh, where this kind of darker layers are the collagen domain. And then these uh, less filamentous layers on the end we think are the flanking domain and histidine rich uh, proteins. And we can see there's a high degree of periodicity. So these are packed in this really specific way yet they must be fluid because they assemble. And th this is basically what we have here is a liquid crystal. So a liquid crystal similar to what you find in your, your, your TV or your computer monitor, um, except here that the, the molecules are, are made of proteins that are aligning really well. Um, so they're, they have some crystalline order, but they're also fluid making them a liquid crystal. So again, we use this technique of focused ion beam SEM 
uh, and again, you're going to look at an image stack, you can see this, the, the layering within these vesicles that are coming from the uh, collagen proteins. If we uh, go through this again, we, we can see these layers. Um, we can recreate this into a three-dimensional object that we can, uh, we can actually you know, manipulate. And you see, this is a chunk of the tissue with a bunch of these uh, vesicles, which are organized inside the tissue. And then again, this is the work of Francisca Yela. She uh, isolated several of these vesicles here. We have about 25. And if we zoom in on these, uh, and we're again here, we're isolating them and we're only looking at the dark staining region of the vesicle. We can see this layered structure in three dimensionals and we can in three dimensions and we can really confirm uh, that we have this uh, liquid crystalline structure. We can even see what are called defects. That's where two layers kind of come together. Uh, we can see liquid crystal defects here. And the idea is that this liquid crystal phase is pre-aligning the molecules so that they can really quickly uh, self-assemble into the semi-crystalline fibers that we, that we see in the, in the thread. Um, so again, this is not just pretty pictures. We can, I'm not going to go into the details here, but we can use these three-dimensional objects to gain quantitative information about, about the packing of these proteins. And then we can actually relate that to what we know about the um, protein sequence. And I'm not gonna go into the details here, but what we can look at is the, again, the hydropathy. So that's like how polar and nonpolar are different regions of the protein chain. So here's, here's the protein uh, plotted uh, for hydropathy at uh, pH five and pH eight. So pH five is the storage pH, pH eight is seawater. We're plotting hydropathy, we're plotting charge distribution. So blue uh, is positive charge and yellow is negative charge. And what can you see here? You see, again, blocks uh, that are, that are um, consistent and then change, right? So we have what we have again, kind of a block copolymer structure. We have a central region that's highly charged and hydrophilic. We have the flanking regions, which are uncharged and hydrophobic. And then at the ends, we have these regions that uh, at low pH are, are highly positively charged, but then they lose some of their charge uh, at low pH. And we believe that it's this block copolymer structure that guides the proteins to assemble into this kind of layered liquid crystal structure, okay? And the other interesting thing here is I mentioned this is positively charged at uh, low pH and then uncharged at high pH. This is coming from all that histidine. Histidine has a pKa of about 6.5. And it mean, what does that mean? It means that at, at acidic pH, it's gonna be positively charged. At basic pH, it's gonna be neutral. Uh, and we think that this is a key factor that converts this from a liquid to a solid, okay? because when these are positively charged, they're gonna be repulsive and they're not gonna to wanna to interact with each other. When we go to pH eight, they're gonna be deprotonated. They're going to be able to interact with one another. And more importantly, they're gonna be able to form these metal coordination bonds, which can't form when they're charged. Okay, so we think there's, a, there's kind of a really cool uh, assembly process going here. And again, we used a similar approach with the induced threads uh, that we, um, uh, we can induce this formation process. We can look at early stages of assembly, later stages of assembly. We see something that looks like fiber. We see individual vesicles that are fusing together to form the threads. Uh, we can compare this to a native thread. And if we look at this again with polarized light microscopy, again, where we see bright, it means alignment. So is the induced thread as well aligned as the native? No, not even close, but it is aligned. Uh, it's aligned uh, over lengths that are larger than the vesicles. And it tells you that the vesicle pre-alignment plays an important role uh, in this assembly process. And we can also see this when we purify the proteins or even when we purify the vesicles, we can form fibers from these. So this led us to the following uh, assembly model uh, where we think uh, in the vesicles, you have these kind of um, pre-aligned liquid crystal phases that are, are fluid, but, but have some positional order. In this case, we have a low pH, we have histidines that are positively charged, and so that prevents them from assembling. And then when these are secreted and put into seawater, um, the threads self-assemble and uh, cross-linked by these uh, metal coordination bonds. Okay, 
So that's the that's the story of of um, of Midlis. and uh, I think I've shown you that that the formation process is really interesting and, and really re relies on these liquid protein phases of of phase separated liquid liquid um, phase separations, and also liquid crystals. And now I just want to end with some really uh, new results from the lab. Uh, we don't have a whole lot on this topic, but this is the work of Mimi Simmons. She's uh, prepping this uh, for, for publication at the moment. And I think this, this uh, even though we've done less work on this, this uh, example is more relevant for the, the topic uh, of the meeting on invasive species because zebra and quagga mussels who are, who are related um, are hugely invasive in North America. Again, they, they originally came from Europe, um, but uh, were introduced through shipping into rivers and lakes in North America. They're a major nuisance um, with biofouling um, and they're a you know, multi-billion dollar problem. Um, and again, these, these guys are, are pretty similar. They have a foot. Um, we can go get them in the river, uh, in the St. Lawrence River. They have a foot, they make a byssus. Uh, if we compare them to Middleus edulis, which is the blue mussel I was just telling you about, um, they're much smaller, the fibers are much smaller, but if we compare them mechanically, uh, and this is some work um, that was done in the group of Emily Carrington, these fibers are stiffer, they're more extensible, and they're tougher, more importantly, than edulis. So they become a really interesting role model, and probably these properties are important for their ability to um, take over uh, waterways and, and invade uh, new ecosystems. So again, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, but the, the main take home message is that uh, we thought, well, maybe these uh, these samples, these fibers are kind of similar to, to middleist threads, maybe they're collagen based, and we they couldn't be more different. So this is really an example of um, convergent evolution where you have a, a, an organism creating a fiber that's mechanically pretty similar to the other one, but with a completely different um, protein structure. So this was really surprising for us. Uh, so first we looked at it with Raman spectroscopy. We saw this sharp peak at 1672. Uh, and uh, we and this is the amide one band. So that could be collagen. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. Could be, could be collagen. But this was, this hypothesis was completely blown away when we looked at FTIR. And again, here, we can look at the, and these are complementary techniques that, that tell us information about protein backbone structure. We see a peak at 1627, and this can only be a beta sheet. And beta sheets are actually more similar to what you find in spider silk. And this was completely confirmed for us when we did X-ray diffraction, uh, because there's some very specific peaks that are, that are um, absolutely beta sheet that we see. And it's actually beta sheets that are stacked on top of each other to form crystallites, very similar to what you see in spider silk. So this was really, really surprising and interesting for us. Um, and what was really interesting is then we, we kind of took this similar approach. We said, hey, let's look at the foot and let's try to see where we, how these are um, stored and maybe learn something about how they're formed. So again, we took, uh, here's, a, here's a, a, a micro CT image of the zebra muscle foot we can use uh, histological staining and Raman spectroscopy to identify the glands which form these. We can also do this approach where we were comparing a native thread and an induced thread. And we got another really big surprise because even though all of our evidence with Raman and FTIR suggests that the native thread is a beta sheet, is primarily beta sheet structure, the proteins are stored as alpha helical structures. And if you don't know about protein structure, these two structures couldn't be any different. Uh, coiled co alpha helical coiled coils are compact structures where the backbone is twisted around in a, in a very compact helix. And a beta sheet is the fully, almost fully extended protein chain, which is hydrogen bonded to itself and creates stacked layers. So we thought, what is going on here? Because there's, again, there's no, uh, there's no possibility that, that this isn't an alpha helix based on our, our analysis. Um, so what's going on here? And how are we going from an alpha helix as a storage phase to a beta sheet as a, as a final stage? And what was interesting here, uh, we, we, we watched how a muscle actually makes uh, one of these threads. And we noticed that during the formation process, the foot is actually pulling a lot on the fiber. 
Uh, so we thought, well, maybe it has something to do with, with like the mechanical forces that are acting here, um, maybe to align it. And if you look at the native thread, uh, we see this again, this is polarized light microscopy, gives it this bright blue color. It tells us the proteins are aligned. Here, uh, you have this pink background. It's not as bright. It means the proteins are, are less aligned. So we said, well, what happens if we take one of these induced threads, which is less aligned, and we just stretch it? And immediately we saw that the, the peak is shifting from an alpha helical uh, position at 1655 to a beta sheet position at 1669. So again, these are very kind of preliminary data that we're, we're working on, but it's telling us that the formation process is, is, uh, is um, that the, the mechanical uh, stress or the mechanical shear forces acting on these proteins are really important for, for the maturation of the thread and for their mechanical properties, okay? And this alpha to beta transition is not something that, that's um, totally unusual because this is something that's also even observed in your own hair. Uh, keratin is also a uh, alpha helical coiled coil protein that if you stretch it will, will go towards a beta sheet structure. Uh, it's just that these ones are non-reversible, which, uh, which is an interesting observation. So anyways, that's kind of a new finding and uh, we're, we're pretty excited about this. So anyways, uh, to, to get back to, to kind of the take home, um, I think, I, well, I hope I've shown you that, that muscles are, um, are actually pretty diverse uh, in, in terms of their attachment strategies at the biochemical level, even though the mechanical properties of these threads are maybe not so different. Uh, and uh, it, it remains to be seen, but by understanding these um, attachment strategies, we might be able to somehow prevent them or slow them down from being able to attach onto these surfaces, especially if we're targeting the formation process or, uh, for example, the, uh, the adhesive, right? Um, so that, that's kind of an active area of interest. But the other side of the, 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 the coin that, that our group is really also pushing is the fact that, well, what we find out about the way that these uh, threads are made, uh, well, first of all, they have excellent properties better than or comparable to most uh, engineering plastics, yet they're made under these biologically friendly conditions and they're, um, um, you know, biodegradable and, and have all the, the important uh, sustainability uh, factors in play. And so we actually think we could probably learn something from this chemistry, from this, uh, the, the processing that might inspire new ways of make, making plastics. That's one of the hopes. Um, and I didn't mention the pin and noblest threads, but we've also done uh, quite a bit of work on understanding uh, these, uh, these materials as well. So anyways, uh, with that, I, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people that did the work here. So um, a lot of the work on Middleus was done uh, by Franci and by Tobias. Um, and the work on the zebra and quagga mussels uh, was done by Mimi Simmons. A lot of the work was done in collaboration with researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam in, uh, in Germany, uh, where I used to be a group leader, as well as some, some folks at, uh, at McGill as well. And uh, the funding sources for this research are both uh, Canadian and German uh, in nature. And finally, thank you so much again for this invitation. I hope uh, this was informative uh, and, uh, and useful uh, for all of you. Thank you.